Alternative Investments, a summary. When we say traditional investments, we mean long-only positions in stocks, bonds and cash. Alternative investments then is almost everything else. The types of alternative investments that we will consider here are hedge funds, private equity, commodities and real estate. These are the general characteristics of alternative investments. While specific types of alternative investments will have their own characteristics, here are some general characteristics of alternative investments. Typically they have high fees, so they are expensive. There is low diversification within alternative investments. So if we just have private equity investments, the diversification across these is going to be low. Often with alternative investments, there is a high use of leverage. Typically, these are illiquid and impose restrictions on redemptions. Managers tend to have a very focused specialization. Generally, there is a low correlation with traditional investments, which is a huge plus. There is a low level of regulation and therefore low transparency associated with alternative investments. There is limited and potentially problematic risk and return data. So the past data is not as easily available as say data for stocks and bonds. And often they are unique legal and tax considerations. From a portfolio perspective, here is the key point. There is generally a low correlation between some categories of alternative investments and traditional investments. This coupled with the fact that many alternative investments have a relatively high return, these two combine to give us a diversification benefit. And that's why in many portfolios, a small component is allocated to alternative investments. Let's talk about hedge funds now. These are the general characteristics of hedge funds. The main goal is of generating high returns, either in an absolute sense or over a specified benchmark. Hedge funds tend to have very few investment restrictions. With hedge funds, we often have aggressively managed portfolio of investments across asset classes and regions. There is generally a high use of leverage. Both long and short positions can be used. Here are some more characteristics. Aggressively managed portfolio of investments across asset classes across regions, there is often high leverage, both long and short positions, and there is the use of derivatives. Hedge funds are typically set up as private investment partnerships open to a limited number of investors willing and able to make a large initial investment. These often impose restrictions on redemptions. From an exam perspective, you need to know that there are several different hedge fund strategies. These are the four major categories. So learn these categories and you should also know one or two lines about each of these subcategories. With event driven strategies, we try to profit from short term events that are expected to affect individual companies. One example is merger arbitrage. So if we believe that a certain company is going to be taken over, then we should buy stocks in those companies because chances are that the value of that company will go up. So that would be merger arbitrage. Relative value strategies, these profit from a pricing discrepancy between related securities. And here are specific types of relative value strategies. Macro strategies profit from economic trends evolving across the world. Trades are made based on expected movement in macroeconomic variables. And then the fourth category, equity hedge strategies. Here we profit by taking long and short positions in equity and equity derivative securities. These are the different types of equity hedge strategies. A very common fee structure with hedge funds is 2 and 20, which means 2% management fee. So this is based on assets under management at the end of a given period. And then there is a 20% incentive fee. So hedge fund managers make most of their money here. If the profits are high, 
then obviously this 20% number of a high number will also be a high number. So in this way, the incentives of a hedge fund manager and the investor are aligned. In the context of fund of funds, you might hear 1 and 10. Now, first understand what we mean by fund of funds. So, a fund of funds is essentially a combination of hedge funds. So, if you have hedge fund 1, 2, 3, 4, and then a fund is created which combines these four hedge funds, that's called a fund of funds. So, in this situation, there will be a fee at this level so each individual fund will have its own fee structure and let's say that the fee structure here is 2 and 20 then on top of that the fund of funds will also have its fee structure which might be 1 and 10 so with fund of funds we do get some diversification across hedge funds but then there is this additional layer of fees the 1 refers to 1% fee for assets under management and 10% refers to the incentive fee very often with the fee there are some provisions so if there is a hurdle rate this means that the incentive fee is paid if a given hurdle rate is exceeded and that hurdle rate might let's say be five percent or it might be the rate on t-bills the incentive fee is calculated based on exceeding this hurdle rate a high water mark is a situation where the incentive fee is calculated based on a previous high so if at the end of year one a fund reaches this level and then end of year two the fund is down then end of year three let's say the fund is here there will be no incentive fee because we have not exceeded this earlier high water mark you can think of this as follows the hedge fund manager has already received a fee for this performance for essentially getting up to this point so until the fund manager exceeds that point he should not be receiving an incentive fee again now that is the case if we do have a high water mark notice that both the hurdle rate and the high water mark are good for the investor but these provisions might bring down the fee for hedge fund managers hedge fund managers may use leverage to seek high returns and they often trade through prime brokers Redemptions can magnify losses. Redemptions may require hedge fund managers to liquidate positions and incur transaction costs. So this is where investors say that they want their money back. If investors demand their money back, then hedge funds might have to sell positions which are currently underpriced and that obviously will mean that they are going to be losses and the transaction costs might also be high. Drawdown refers to a decline in net asset value and this might trigger redemptions. The redemption fees, notice periods and lockup periods seek to minimize impact of drawdowns. So by having redemption fees and notice periods, hedge funds try to discourage investors from taking out their money too quickly and this will reduce the impact of a drawdown. So if NAV is temporarily down and we have these provisions then investors will be less inclined to pull their money out while the investments are not performing too well. Hedge funds are subject to relatively low regulation and as I mentioned earlier one category of hedge funds is fund of funds where the benefit is that there is diversification. It also allows investors to enter the hedge fund arena with a relatively low investment amount. The con is that the fees tend to be higher because we have two layers of fees and also because of the diversification while there is lower risk the potential of very high returns is also lower. Hedge funds are generally valued on either a daily, weekly, monthly or quarterly basis. The value of a hedge fund depends on the value of underlying positions if the underlying positions have market prices and are fairly liquid then the most common way of valuing the underlying instruments is to take the average of the bid and ask price if they are market prices but they are illiquid then we should consider a liquidity discount which is also called a haircut if the market prices are not available then we need to estimate the value of the underlying positions which is very subjective
It is extremely important to perform due diligence when investing in hedge funds. So we need to understand the investment strategy of the hedge fund, the investment process, what is the competitive advantage, what is the track record, how long has the fund been around for, what's their management style, is there a key person risk, what's the reputation of the fund and the management, what is their investor relations like, do they plan to grow, what sort of risk management system do they have in place and so on. Now. I need you to see this list and try to remember this list because these aspects of due diligence are common across other categories of alternative investments too. Private equity. There are two major types of private equity firms, leveraged buyout firms and venture capital firms. With leveraged buyout firms, investors put their money in the LBO or the leveraged buyout firm and then the general manager of the LBO uses the money to buy companies or to make investments in companies. The LBO firms typically acquire companies through significant debt financing. So the investor's money is used to buy a company but in addition to that money there is significant debt financing also involved. So debt financing essentially is leverage and since there is high use of leverage that's why these are referred to as leveraged buyouts. LBO's capital structure comprises of equity, bank debt and high yield bonds. The target companies for LBO's, so these sorts of companies typically have undervalued stock price so it is a good idea to buy them. Their current stock price is below what it should be. The management is willing and companies which are inefficient the idea is that the LBO wants to take over inefficient companies, make them efficient and then sell them at a high price. The target companies should have low leverage. Notice that since these companies are being bought using debt, we don't want a situation where the companies already have a high debt. So a good target company should have low debt, low leverage, but strong and stable cash flows so that those cash flows can be enhanced easily and then the cash flow can be used to pay off the debt. And often it would be nice if these companies, the target companies have lots of physical assets because these assets can be used as collateral for the debt. The other category is venture capital firms. VC firms invest in private companies, these are the portfolio companies, with significant growth potential. So very simplistically, LBO firms invest in companies that are relatively large and have stable cash flows, whereas VC firms invest in small companies, startups with substantial growth potential. The venture capitalists are actively involved with the companies in which they invest. The investing can take place at various stages. So we have formative stage which has subcategories called angel investing, seed stage investing and early stage. Then they can also be later stage investing and mezzanine stage investing. Private equity firms is very simplistically as follows. They are set up as partnerships. A general partner runs the firm and Limited partners are essentially the investors. So LPs put in the money, the general partner might also put in their money, but it's the general partner that is identifying the companies or the target companies to invest in. There is often a committed capital. So the general partner will ask the limited partners to commit a certain amount of capital and then that capital is drawn down or asked for as investment opportunities become available. The management fee is typically 1 to 3 percent of committed capital and the, in and the incentive fee is often 20 percent of total profit. Private equity, the ultimate goal is to improve new or underperforming businesses and exit them at high valuations. Companies are often held for an average of five years. The possible exit strategies are shown here. One is a trade sale where the company is sold to a competitor or some other strategic buyer. There might be an IPO. So this could often be the case with VC investments where a small company is made large enough and then there is an IPO. 
there might be a recapitalization where a company re-leverages itself when interest rates are low. There might be a secondary sale, which is a sale to another private equity firm, or the worst case scenario is a write-off or liquidation. Private equity may provide higher returns relative to traditional investments. Private equity gives investors access to private companies as opposed to publicly traded companies. The ability to actively manage and improve portfolio companies. So with private equity, we actually get into the target company. So the general partner has the ability or the potential to improve the valuation of the portfolio company. And often there is the use of leverage. For investors, this is the LPs. The most important advice is to identify and invest in the best performing private equity funds. So, so LPs are trusting their money. They are giving their money to the GP. So we want to give money to GPs, general partners who have an established track record. Next, we come to real estate. The major reasons for investing in real estate are shown here. There is a potential for competitive long-term returns, both in terms of income and capital appreciation. The rent from long-term leases will lessen the impact of economic shocks. So even when the economy is down, say asset prices are down, but the rent will keep coming. It gives a good diversification benefit and it's a hedge against inflation. The investment characteristics of real estate are shown here, indivisibility. So you can't take a piece of real estate and split it into pieces. Every piece of real estate will have some unique characteristics. It has a fixed location. Often there is a high amount of management associated with maintaining real estate. The local markets can be very different from national or global markets. Different categories of real estate are shown here. We can have residential property. Uh, this involves investment in a residence with the intent to occupy. If we buy residential property using some debt and some of our own money, then this would be called leveraged equity. Commercial property, this involves investments in property for commercial reasons. And let's say we invest in a hotel, then this will require experienced management to run the hotel and we also need an experienced management team to identify the best investments. These investments tend to be illiquid. We can also have REIT investing. So REIT stands for Real Estate Investment Trusts where we essentially buy a REIT can be thought of as a portfolio of real estate investments and then we buy a piece of this pool. So in a sense, it's like a mutual fund. Mortgage backed securities are generally covered under fixed income, but since underlying these securities are real estate properties, that's why sometimes these are also categorized under real estate. Timber and farmland. So from an exam perspective, you need to know the following. Timberland functions as a factory and store. It's a store in the sense that if you have lots of trees, those trees are stored on your property and the trees are also growing. So in that sense, it's like a factory. The return drivers are the growth. So as the trees become larger, there is more timber. If timber prices increase, that represents an increase in value and land appreciation also represents a form of return. Farmland is perceived to provide a hedge against inflation because the crops that are sold, obviously, if there is high inflation, those prices are going up, which means that the value of your investment goes up. Return drivers are harvest quantities, commodity prices and land appreciation. These are the common techniques for appraising real estate property. There is a comparable sales approach where we look at the value of comparable properties. There is the income approach where we look at future cash flows and discount back. Then there is the cost approach, which in very simple terms is how much will it cost to recreate a property such as the one that we are evaluating. With REIT valuation, there are broadly speaking two approaches, income-based and asset-based. Income-based is similar to direct 
capitalization so we look at future cash flows and then discount back or we can say okay here is the next cash flow and then this is divided by a discount rate to come up with the value at time zero so then the question becomes how do we define the cash flow or how do we define the income there are two measures one is called the FFO another is adjusted FFO FFO is essentially net income plus depreciation so this is the cash flow minus any gains from sales of real estate plus losses on sales of real estate so this is a very simplistic measure of the cash generated from our investments the asset based approach involves calculating the REITs net asset value which is the market value of total assets minus liabilities and if you want to come up with this number on a per share basis we divide by the total number of shares there are several investment risks property values are subject to variability based on national and global economic conditions there is a question as to the ability of fund management to select finance and manage real estate properties the expenses may increase unexpectedly and if there is leverage involved in the purchase of real estate then this leverage can actually magnify the risks when evaluating real estate performance we have to compare with indices there are various indices available and the different types of indices are shown here we can have appraisal based indices repeat sales or transaction based indices and reit indices coming now to commodities commodities are physical products the return depends on price changes only this is because commodities do not have a cash flow associated with them so a commodity like gold for example does not have any cash flow generally investment in commodities is through derivative instruments such as forwards futures or options contracts may trade on exchanges or over the counter other commodity investment vehicles are shown here we can have exchange traded funds common stock of companies which are exposed to a particular commodity we can have managed futures funds individual managed accounts or we could have investments in specific commodity sectors this point is important the benefits of commodities commodities are viewed as a good inflation hedge and there is generally a low correlation between commodities and traditional investments because of which we have a diversification benefit commodity spot prices are a function of supply and demand cost of production value to users and global economic conditions the futures price of a commodity is based on the spot price the risk free rate storage costs which increase the futures price of a commodity and any benefit such as a convenience yield which would reduce the futures price the convenience yield is the benefit or value associated with holding a physical asset futures prices may be higher or lower than spot prices based on the convenience yield if the futures price is greater than the spot price then we say the market is in contango if the futures price is less than the spot price then we say that the market is in backwardation with futures contracts there are three sources of return roll yield collateral yield and spot prices so if the spot prices go up then the spot yield or spot price yield will be positive next we talk about infrastructure related investments assets underlying infrastructure investments are real capital intensive and long lived they are for public use and provide essential services generally most infrastructure assets are financed owned and operated by governments however increasingly infrastructure assets are being financed privately infrastructure investments can be categorized in different ways one characteristic is based on the underlying asset or the type of underlying asset you might have assets which are providing a direct economic benefit so transportation and utility infrastructure assets would be providing a direct economic benefit then we can have assets which are providing a social benefit so this would be in the education or healthcare space 
another categorization is based on stage of development of underlying assets so we could make an investment in early stage infrastructure projects or later stage infrastructure projects then a third category is based on the geographic location so making infrastructure investments in let's say russia versus malaysia there are different forms of infrastructure investments very broadly speaking we could either invest directly or indirectly through publicly traded investment vehicles a direct investment would give us more control but the amount of the investment would have to be very high risk and return overview with infrastructure projects that have low risk and stable cash flows the returns are likely to be low and infrastructure projects with relatively higher risk are more likely to offer potentially higher returns finally risk management both investors and risk managers should be concerned about risk management we should recognize that risks vary across different alternative investments also when we look at historical data returns and standard deviations might be biased the reported correlations might vary from actual correlations traditional risk measures such as the sharpe ratio may not be adequate when evaluating alternative investments this is because with alternative investments we often have asymmetric risk and return profiles there is limited transparency and most alternative investments tend to be illiquid it is extremely important to perform due diligence of alternative investment managers and this is particularly important in the case of hedge funds and private equity because the returns depend very heavily on the abilities of the fund manager